together then, and uh, chapter four, and uh, we'll read from the first verse. Now this displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, our Lord, was not this exactly what I said would happen when I was still in my own country? And it was this re for this reason I fled to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, a God who relents from doing harm. And so now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And so the Lord said to him, is it right for you to be so angry? Jonah went out of the city and he sat on its east side. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. It happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry, even to the point of death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not laboured, nor made it grow, a plant that came up in a night and perished in a night. Now, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? So think back now to the first Sunday of the year and we talked about the need for a vision and we set ourselves the task on that Sunday morning of having our own vision of God. Do you remember I, uh, by looking at Isaiah 40, talked with you about a series of visions in Isaiah 40 that we could take for ourselves. There was the vision of God in himself. There was the vision of God in relation to creation. There was the vision of God in relation to the world in which we live. There was the vision of God, you remember, in relation to his people. We set those visions out for us and we then challenged each other to take one or maybe more than one of those visions and pursue them so that we have a vision of God to keep us, strengthen us, encourage us, sustain us as we go through these challenging times. I want to build on that this morning then and uh, all of those ideas of uh, visions of God are found in Jonah but I want to slightly change the focus and I want to talk with you this morning about the idea of having a vision of God in terms of the ends to which God works. What are the goals that God has? Let's have a vision of the goals to which God is working towards. So I want to use the story of Jonah to help us think about the goals that God works towards. And then I'm going to ask you to consider that idea from a bigger perspective. So we'll close by thinking about the wider, the greater goals uh, that God is working towards. So it's the idea then of the ends or the goals to which God works. So if you think about this from the book of Jonah, the end, the goal, 
that God had in mind was that the Ninevites should turn to him. That was the goal the end to which God was working. Now, our problem is we often read the book of Jonah from Jonah's point of view. So I'm asking us to read the book of Jonah from God's point of view. What was God doing? What was he working towards? What end did God have in mind? So that's what we're going to think about. And then we're going to ask the question, what did God use to bring that end about? What means are in the hands of God that he uses to bring about his ends, his goals. So we'll see that in the book of Jonah. And then we'll broaden that out and I'll, I'll encourage you to think about this idea of God working towards his goals uh, from a picture point of view. So that's our plan for this morning. Let's ask God to bless us as we do so. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have fellowship in this way. On a day when the snow has fallen here in Wales, and it's tricky for us to meet physically in a building, we can have fellowship like this uh, via Zoom, and we thank you for it. We commend ourselves to you as we meet. We ask your blessing upon us, and we ask you, our God, to open your word to us, that we might be given understanding of it and that we might rejoice in it. So we look to you, we ask your blessing upon us, in Jesus' name, amen. So we are thinking about the uh, goals to which God works. I prefer the word end, so I hope that's okay with everyone. What are the ends to which God works? Well, in the story of Jonah, the end is that the city of Nineveh, should turn from its wicked ways and, if you like, in a sense, turn to God. A God whom they didn't know, a God who was not their God, and the Ninevites were a people who did not belong to this God. So the, the idea is a God who was unknown to the people of Nineveh wanted the people of Nineveh to turn to him to turn from their gods, I guess, and to turn to the, the God of Israel. That was the end, the goal, the purpose that God had in mind, that this city of 120 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, God wanted them to turn to him. That's the end, the goal. So with that in mind then, you almost read the story of Jonah backwards. How does God bring about that end? And the first thing I want you to notice is that God uses his word to bring about that end. The word of God. So if you look at chapter three of Jonah and uh, you've got verse four, this is what you read there. Jonah began to enter the city on the first day. And he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, that's the word of God. So God is using that message. It's a message of destruction. It's a message of disaster. And God is using that word to achieve the goal that God has in mind. And what has struck me thinking about that is that this word is a word of disaster. It's not a word of love. It's not a word of encouragement. It's not a word of comfort. It's a word of disaster that God uses to bring about the goal of the people of Nineveh turning to him. Now, what does that tell us? How God uses a word of disaster of judgment, of wrath, a word in which God says, in 40 days' time, I will rain fire down upon Nineveh. That's the word of God that becomes effective in bringing this city from its evil ways. The word of God is what God uses. And so as you go down into 
verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3, you have this image of disaster, of fierce anger. This is the expression, the revelation of the word of God in that city. That's an amazing thing. And it's, it's caused me to think about the meaning of that for today. Should there be today a word of disaster in the mouth of the people of God? But uh, it's a question to ask, but at this point, I want to notice that that's what God uses. It's one of the means that God uses to bring about that goal. So the word of God is used. That's means number one. What do you reckon is means number two that God uses? There's no particular order, but let me show you how they've appeared to me. The second means that God uses is the means of providence. And the idea of providence is connected with human life, with events, circumstances, happenings, if you like, chance, it would seem to us. God uses chance events to bring about that goal of turning the Ninevites from their evil ways. So what do we mean? Most famous chance in the story of Jonah is chapter one and verse three, where Jonah goes down to the uh, port of Joppa and there is a boat ready to sail to Tarshish. That looks like pure chance that he turns up on that particular day. He wants to get as far away from Nineveh as he can. And there is a boat that is going to take him as far away from Nineveh as you could possibly get at that moment. Now, does that look like good luck? Does it seem to be a coincidence? Well, the doctrine of providence captures all those ideas of chance, good luck, events, happenings, and they are all under the umbrella of the providence of God. And God uses providence to bring about the goals that he has in mind. So jo Jonah wants to run away, and so God ensures that that boat, going as far away as possible from Nineveh, is there at the moment Jonah needs it, so that Jonah can get on board, he can sail away, and it can all look as if his own plans are coming about, Jonah. But of course, God is just using that as a means to an end. So think of providence, think of all the events, the timings of events, the, the, the good luck or the bad luck situations that we encounter, all of this, comes under the providence of God. And God uses his providence to bring about the goals that he is working towards. So number one is his word. Number two is providence. Number three in the story of Jonah, as I see it, and don't forget now it's no particular order, but number three are acts of creation. When we think of creating, and God's creation, we think of it as something that came to an end on day six. Creation stopped. But the book of Jonah tells us that God goes on creating. And he goes on creating so that he can achieve what he wants. So think about acts of creation in the story of Jonah. Chapter 1, uh, verse 17. God had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. This is an individual moment of the creative activity of God. This isn't a fish that was like any other fish. It's not a fish that we would have recognized or categorized or put in an encyclopedia of fish. This is a one-off act of creation. And God does this to bring about his goal. And of course, in chapter four, very famously, you've got two acts of creation, verses six and seven. God creates a plant in verse six. 
to grow over Jonah in a day. So it's a super fast growing plant that grows up and provides shelter for Jonah from the sun. And then God creates a work to destroy the plant. Now, these are moments, just like in Genesis, where God puts his creative power in action and creates. And so creation is one thing God uses to bring about his goals. So do you see how this, this idea works? God wants the Ninevites to turn, so he brings his word, he uses providence, he even creates, he has moments of individual creation to achieve that end. Do you get the idea? What's the fourth thing that God does here in the story of Jonah? Well, I think it's quite relevant for today, this, you know, this particular Sunday morning, because God uses his control over nature to bring about this goal of the Ninevites. So think about the wind, uh, both in chapter four and in chapter one. Think about the storm in chapter one, the sea in chapter one. Uh, let's take a look. Jonah one and verse four. God sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Here is God using nature, the things that are part and parcel of life in our world to achieve his goal. And God will always use nature to achieve what he wants. So today, We've missed, some of us, our one and only chance of seeing other human beings in the flesh because of the snow. Why snow on a Sunday? Let's ask God that question. Why have you chosen Sunday to bring snow to Wales so that we can't get out of our homes, those of us who are able to, and meet others, you know, in the flesh? We can't do it. Tomorrow we would be able to. Yesterday we could, but not today. Now, why is that? God uses nature to achieve his ends, to achieve his goals. And this is true on a Sunday morning when snow keeps us indoors. It's true in terms of um, the, the great storms that we witness. The nature is, can I use this word, subordinated, used by God for God to bring about his purposes. So nature is one of the means that God uses. So let me list them again. The word of God, you've got the providence of God and providence is a wonderful biblical doctrine because it, it, it incorporates every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, the great events, the little events. You've got acts of creation, and you've got nature, God's use and control of nature. One more, I guess, at least as I see it, and that is humanity. God uses men and women to achieve his goals. So in the story of Jonah, we meet the sailors and we meet Jonah himself. And these two give us the idea of how God is able to use human beings to achieve his ends. So if you think about the sailors, first of all, what do you discover as you think about the sailors? They're in chapter one, aren't they? And uh, we meet them, they give Joan a passage, and they then sail off into the Mediterranean, and then there's this wind and there's this storm and we see them rowing and we see their struggle and we see their heroism and we see their courage. We see their compassion for Jonah. We see their religious beliefs in operation. They believe that they're being punished for some sin, some gods are sending the storm to punish them. They want to know which particular God is at work and which particular sinner is responsible for this storm. So you see their worldview, these sailors, you see their beliefs, 
you see their struggle, you see them having pity on Jonah, you see them finally throw Jonah overboard into the sea. Now, here's humanity on display. Everything that you could wish to see, you find in these sailors. You've got courage and struggle and faith and obedience and compassion and kindness. You've got it all. And God uses all of this to bring about his goal of turning Nineveh to him. Now, just think of that for a moment. The whole of human experience is used by God to achieve God's purposes. So if we talk about the good qualities of human beings, if we talk about the bad qualities of human beings, if you think about interactions, conversations, relationships, kindness, all of this is used by God to achieve what God wants. On the human level, everything that happens is in the hands of God and is used by God for God to achieve his purposes. Now, this is a wonderful picture of God, a God who is using things. He is weaving together all these things to achieve what he wants. So the sailors then, for many people, the sailors are a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They are a type. Uh, they are an example of humanity and how God works through human beings to achieve his purpose. And then, of course, lastly, we've got Jonah himself. So you need to think about Jonah as a means, as a, a way that God uses to achieve his purposes. So I want you to think about Jonah like this. We meet a public Jonah, who is a prophet, and we have a private Jonah, who is a person. You could almost say that private Jonah is a patriot. He is an Israelite, and he loves his people. So public Jonah, the prophet, who has a wonderful understanding of God, look at chapter 4 and verse 2. He's got the, a deep understanding of the compassion of God. Jonah the prophet is sent to Nineveh. Jonah the private man doesn't want to go. Jonah the patriotic Israelite doesn't want to go. So here is a man in conflict. He's in conflict between his public life and his private self. Publicly, we see him in Nineveh, walking through the city, proclaiming the word of God, speaking a word of disaster. The private Jonah, nobody would have seen on that day. If you were a Ninevite, you would have seen a public prophet of the God of Israel marching through your streets, declaring wrath and judgment in 40 days. You would have never seen the struggle of the private man. You would not have had any clue about the private patriotic Jonah's conflict. You would have just seen this public prophet of God obediently proclaiming the word of God. But what about private Jonah? Private Jonah is angry. Private Jonah is despairing. Private Jonah has lost hope. Private Jonah faints under the heat. Private Jonah is pathetically grateful for the shade a little plant offers him. Private Jonah goes down to the very depths, um, not just of the sea, but he goes to the very depths of his experience of God. Um, Jonah has this darkness inside of him in terms of his relationship with God. So public, private Jonah. And what is truly wonderful is that God uses both the public Jonah 
and a private Jonah to bring about his goals. And God doesn't use the one over against the other. Both are in the hands of God. And God uses both to achieve what he wants for the city of Nineveh. And that is an amazing thing, isn't it? That God not only uses our public self, but he uses our private selves. God doesn't just use our outward voice that people hear, but God uses our inner voice that only we hear, that only he hears. God doesn't just use our obedience, he uses our disobedience. God doesn't just use our faithfulness. God uses our struggles. God doesn't just use our spirituality. God uses our humanity and our struggle. And both are used by God to achieve his ends. So you've got humanity in general represented by the sailors. And you've got humanity in particular, an individual human being being used by God for this great work, a man with a public face and a man with a private life. And both the public face and the private life are used by God equally to bring about what God wants. And so the story of Jonah ends with Jonah, the private man, sitting, looking over the city of Nineveh, waiting to see what happens. But God declaring that his goal was always that Nineveh should turn from their wickedness because Nineveh um, moved God to compassion. And it's a favorite verse of mine, I'm sure it is of you, the very last verse, which is our text, verse 11 of chapter 4. Because here is a clear picture of the compassion of God on a people who were not his people. Uh, they were later on in history going to turn against Israelite and, uh, Israel and defeat Israel. But at this moment in time, God was moved with compassion towards the people. And you get that sense of the compassion of God as you listen to verse 11. Listen to it again. Should I not pity Nineveh? Now, pity there is the great word that the Israelites were possessive of. Covenant pity. Covenant mercy. But these were the Ninevites. They weren't in a covenant with God. But here is God expressing his covenant pity and mercy. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left? There's that moving of God's heart out towards this uh, city of people who are ignorant of him who are living their lives in spiritual darkness and who do not know that they're in spiritual darkness. It's the ignorance of the people of Nineveh, of the truth that moves God here. And of course, this is then later mirrored in the life of Jesus when Jesus walks towards Jerusalem and he's moved with pity and compassion over the city of Jerusalem. So that's what God wants. He wants this city to turn to him because he has had compassion on them. And God then uses these means, his word, providence, acts of creation, nature, and humanity. God uses this to bring about what he wants. So let's finish then with this thought. Let's, let's expand outwards and have a bigger picture. What are the great goals to which God is working? What's the big picture here? And I want you to think of it like this. What goal is God working towards for himself as God? How would you answer that? And I think it's very important that we answer this in the right way. 
God is working towards the goal of his own glory. And that's the most fundamental goal for God. He is working so that the whole world will be filled with his glory. And one of the phrases that's used, particularly in the Old Testament, to express that idea is the idea that you find in Habakkuk and you find in Isaiah. The phrase, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Do you remember how it ends? As the waters cover the sea. Now, what does that mean? I've looked at that. Perhaps you would like to look at it. What does the phrase, the waters cover the sea, mean? Because, of course, waters cover the sea. It's almost like stating the obvious. So what does it mean then when we read that God will is working towards the day when his glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now, God is working towards that end, and he's using his word, he's using providence, nature, creation, and humanity to achieve that end. Let's think about the goal that God is working towards for his son, Jesus Christ. What's the great goal that God has? for his son, Jesus Christ. And as I see it, there are two. There's a goal that God is working towards for his son in relation to humanity in general. And that goal is that every tongue should confess and that every knee should bow. That's the goal in terms of humanity in general. So God is using his word, providence, creation, nature, human beings towards that goal that every knee shall bow. When it comes to the people of God, what is God working towards for his son, Jesus Christ? And the great goal, as I see it, that God has for his son is that his son should be the firstborn among many brethren. That's what God is working towards in terms of his son, Jesus Christ. That Jesus will be the first among many. And get, go through that list again. So God is using his word creation, nature, providence, humanity, towards that goal. And we could pursue, couldn't we? We could pursue these ideas in greater detail. I'm just laying them out for you. But here is where I want to end. What is the goal that God is working towards for you? What is God's goal for every Christian? Now, be careful how you answer this, because coming to faith isn't the goal at all. Coming to faith was a means to that goal. Coming to faith was just a step on the way to that goal. So what's God's goal for you? Now, I know not one of you will answer it in terms of this life, because that's just nonsense. What's God's great goal for you? And God's great goal for you is in Romans 8, that you may be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren whom he foreknew he chose you remember god great goal for you is that you should be like christ 
you will be like him physically, you will be raised from the dead and have a new body. You will be like him in terms of your spirit, your soul. You will be made like him. You will share his glory. As he is, so you shall be. Where he is, you will be with him. So this is God's great goal for you. So I want you to try and spend the rest of the day like this. What are the means that God is using to bring about that goal for you? How is God using his word to bring about that goal for you? How is God using providence to bring about that goal? What are the providences in your life? that in the hands of God are a means to that great end. So the events, the luck, the chance, the happenings of your life, how are they being used in the hands of God to bring about that great goal he has for you? Can you see what I'm asking you to do? I want you to think about how God is using nature in your life now, specifically. Has God ever used an act of creation to bring about his goal for you? How is God using other people to bring about his goal for you? How is he using people in general? So how is God using our political leaders? How is God using your colleagues? How is God using your neighbours, those who live around you? How is God using? And then can I ask you, how is God using the public and the private? The public you, the private you. Think of teachers, elders, preachers. They have a public face, but they have a private face. How is God using? How is God using contradictions? How is he using failure? How is God using disobedience? How is he using challenge and discouragement? How is he using despair? How is he using prey? How is he using all these things in order to bring you to glory? Because what you can be sure of God is bringing you to glory. That goal that he has for you is fixed and certain. And God is working step by step. God is working inevitably, inexorably towards that goal. Every moment that passes, every day that unfolds, brings you closer to that goal that God has for you. You will be like Christ. You will be with Christ. You will share his glory and you will be conformed to his image. There is no doubt. There is no question. There is no obstacle. There is nothing that can defeat that goal. This is God's goal for you. So how is he using all these means to bring you towards that goal? Jonah didn't recognize many of them. In fact, Jonah didn't recognize any of them. And in a sense, that's the tragedy of the story of Jonah, is he failed to recognize what goal God always had in mind. He sees it in one sense, because he says, I knew you'd do this, God. That's why I went to Tarshish. I knew back in Israel when you told me to go to Nineveh, I knew you'd have mercy on them. So in a sense, he does. But in a greater sense, he fails to see. And because he fails to see, Jonah then is left in, in that kind of um, cliff uh, edge situation. So let's not be like Jonah. Let's try to recognize what goal God has for us and let's recognize the means that he is using 
to bring about that goal in our lives. So just one last time, how is he using his word? How is he using providence for you? What providences? They may be painful, they may be easy, they may be clear, they may be hidden. How is God doing that? How is he using creation, nature? And again, a challenging one. How is God using people, publicly, privately, to bring you to glory? That's our meditation for the rest of the day. Let me uh, indicate <coughs> our direction of travel. So next Sunday, all being well, who knows if we are able to meet. I want us to focus on a vision of Jesus Christ. And I want us to do that from John 1 and the prologue. And then let's see how it goes. I want us to have a vision of the church. And that's hugely important that we all share the right biblical vision of what the church is, what it isn't and what it is. And then I also want down the line to have a vision of those who are without Christ. What vision should we have as we think about the non-Christian? So the vision of Jesus, the vision of the church, and the vision of those who are without Christ. Because remember, without a vision, the people perish. So let's keep these visions in mind and uh, let's um, be encouraged as we do so. So let's pray together then.